the title of my talk is Longitudinal Trajectories Letting the Data Show Us. So I want to give a very brief methods overview. There are several methods that can be used to conduct longitudinal cluster analysis, and I'm going to be sharing a few of them today. There, uh, I wanted to talk about unsupervised methods, so there are no a priori assumptions about group membership with respect to other study variables like exposures or, or outcomes. That's what I mean when I say unsupervised. I mean, we don't make we don't make any group assignments based on uh, an exposure or outcome, for example, or other variables in the study. And I'm going to briefly highlight some of the methods that an investigator could choose from today. So k-means longitudinal is a non-parametric clustering method. And the approach creates clusters and then calculates the mean trajectory within each cluster. And basically, the algorithm tries to minimize the distance between an individual's mean observation and then the trajectory group mean, and then assigns individuals into clusters in which that distance can be minimized. So this step, the th these three steps are repeated iteratively until there are no more changes in cluster assignment. And there's a really nice R package called KML that can be used to do this. There are quality criteria that can help select the optimal number of clusters, but one drawback is that the solutions do not always converge. In fact, when I've used this approach, they usually don't converge. And so we'll talk about that later as a, as a limitation. Uh, but I just have an example of what this KML looks like in the literature. So this is an example of during pregnancy of exposure to psychotropic medications. And you can see different individual trajectories in the thin lines and then grouped trajectories in the thicker lines representing the average uh, dose across pregnancy months. Moving on to group-based trajectory models. In this approach, analysts specify polynomial shapes of trajectories and a number of the number of possible groups. And these methods simultaneously estimate a multinomial model for group assignment probabilities, and then models estimating longitudinal trajectories using polynomial functions of time, like a cubic function, for example. And then individuals are assigned to the trajectory group in which they had the highest membership probability. And this can be implemented with PROC, TRAGE, and SAS. And Bayesian information criteria are used to help select uh, the optimal number of groups. And um, I just have an ex examples from the literature here. This group-based trajectory models have been used a fair amount now in pharmacoepidemiology to study adherence to medications over time. So look, trying to separate different patterns of individuals' adherence over time to a whole variety of different medications. And then I'll just briefly mention hierarchical clustering analysis. This is an approach based on a custom distance measure. And what's unique about this is this approach can allow for categorical variables to be plotted uh, in trajectories over time. And the user specifies the similarity measure. And an example of this would be a mechanism of action for uh, studying medications. And then the hierarchy of clusters can be visualized through a dendrogram. And um, there's an example here with a reference um, to that in the literature. And then just to touch on a couple more methods, there's latent class analysis as well and latent class growth mixture modeling, which is similar to group-based trajectory models, but then actually allows for variations with in individual trajectories within the same trajectory group. And I just want to briefly touch on some of the concerns when using trajectory analysis. Unfortunately, this doesn't give us a pass on all the typical concerns that we usually have about bias. So measurement error can be a concern and it could change trajectory shape and group membership from what it would have been without error. Confounding and time varying confounding is, can be a really big concern. And an example of this is medication dose trajectories being confounded by disease severity, as you could imagine that changes in medication dose would be caused by changes in disease severity, which could also be related to an outcome under study. 
And then generalizability of observed trajectories to other populations can also be a concern if you're running these models in a specific population. It's always a question of who, who will these trajectories generalize to. And then some other considerations for investigators. There are several different approaches to clustering analysis that I have presented today and I haven't even covered all of them. So investigators would have to pick one uh, or a few in order to do a study. So the best clustering method really depends, I think, on the studying question, study question and available data. And I think that's an area of research to help uh, that's needed to help investigators really understand which approach would be best, best suited for their study question and their data. The selection of cluster number can be subjective. And I did mention some selection criteria when I was giving brief over, the brief overview of the methods. But when it comes down to it, clinical relevance of clusters, trajectory shapes, and sample size are also really important considerations. If we run a trajectory analysis and only find a group of five individuals out of 5,000, that trajectory group might not really be clinically relevant. And then within cluster heterogeneity can be a concern. If there's a lot of noise, we might miss a signal. Uh, so we know that there's going to be heterogeneity within each trajectory, but we just want to make sure it's not so noisy that it's no longer useful. And then just to keep in mind, missing, met missing data methods are not necessarily appropriate. Some of these approaches need the same number of days of observation in order to run. Otherwise, um, missing data methods are Im implemented. But this may not always work out. An example of this is that it might not make sense to necessarily impute medication dose after delivery for those with shorter gestations when trying to study uh, prenatal medication exposure. So if we're trying to study the time during pregnancy and women have varying gestational lengths, then it might not make sense, it wouldn't make sense to try to impute data after the time of delivery in order for everyone to have the same period of observation. So just caution when implementing automatic missing data methods approaches that are sometimes uh, implemented in these cluster analysis packages, software packages. So in summary, longitudinal cluster analysis can help us identify and group individuals with similar trajectories over time. They can help us visualize trajectories, which I think is really important and can be really useful for understanding data and generating hypotheses. And those cluster analysis can simplify high density data while preserving potentially important complexity when trying to study an exposure outcome association. There are several different approaches that investigators will have to consider when conducting a longitudinal cluster analysis. And it's important for investigators to remember that all the biases are still at play and to consider the impact of various biases on uh, the trajectories. Mm -hmm.